Good morning. I'm going to call our meeting for the Minneapolis County Commission to order for August 6, 2024. I'm going to note for the record that we do have a full quorum of commissioners present. Um, before we get started, just a reminder, silence your phone. And I'm going to ask you to stand for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Look for a motion to approve our agenda. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Moving on to our consent agenda. Our consent agenda is our kind of our routine regular business, bills to be paid, personnel actions, all these things are available in the auditor's office, um, public record. Um, is there anybody from the public that would like to comment on any item on the consent agenda? Is there any commissioner that would like to remove any item from the consent agenda? I look for a motion to approve our consent agenda. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Kipley? Aye. Bender? Aye. Blyenberg? Aye. Benega? Aye. Kursky? Aye. Motion carries. Somewhat long regular business agenda, so we'll start right away and look for a motion to issue a proclamation declaring August 7th, 2024 as Professional Engineers Day in Minnehaha County, and I have a son-in-law who's a PE, so got Jacob here to read the proclamation and take action on it. Good morning, commissioners. <clears throat> uh, thank you for this opportunity to promote professional engineers. Um, I'm currently the vice president of the Eastern chapter of the South Dakota Engineering Society, and <clears throat> I will read this proclamation. <clears throat> professional Engineers Day, August 7th, 2024. Whereas licensed professional engineers are dedicated to applying scientific knowledge, mathematics, and ingenuity to develop solutions for technical, societal, and commercial problems while holding paramount the public health, safety, and welfare. Whereas Minneapolis County's licensed professional engineers have made significant contributions on a local and national scale. Whereas Minneapolis County's economy has grown in part because its licensed professional engineers are instrumental to our communities and Whereas August 7th, 2024 has been declared as Professional Engineers Day by the South Dakota Engineering Society in conjunction with the National Society of Professional Engineers, an organization founded in 1934 that represents the interest of licensed professional engineers and those on the path to licensure, who show the highest dedication to the profession in all 50 states and U.S. territories. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Minneapolis County Board of Commissioners declares the day August 7, 2024 to be Professional Engineers Day in Minneapolis County and call upon all citizens to join in this special observance. All right. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. And anybody from the public that would like to have comment on this? All right. We'll turn it back to the commission for uh, discussion and or action. I would make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Congratulations. And I got one more thing to do tomorrow. Congratulate my son-in-law on Professional Engineers Day in South Dakota. So thank, thank you, you, Jacob. All right. Consider a motion to accept and authorize the chair to sign the Stop P Grant Funds Agreement from the South Dakota State Department of Public Safety Victim Services. Good morning. Mr. Hager. Good morning, Daniel Hager, Minneapolis County State's Attorney. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak with each of you about this grant. Uh, the commission may remember this was a grant that we had applied for last year um, that was awarded to us through Department of Public Safety uh, with some federal funds that they have to target intimate partner violence. Mm -hmm. uh, we had hired Cami Pfeiffer as a victim witness assistant. She is here. I'm sure she'll wave. Um, she's doing good work. Um, Last year, Commissioner Kipley had asked me, is this something that we can continue to apply for? Um, I was optimistic at that point. There were other counties that had done this 
um, type of work and uh, grant authorization for about 10 years. So I am hopeful, and this, I guess, is proof that you can at least get two years in a row. Um, so we applied for that again, um, hoping to build on the work that Cammie's done in the past year. Uh, she's initiated um, more direct contact with some of those um, high risk, high lethality cases with those victims, is working with partners in the community to connect them with services. We have um, some good partners who are helping us um, make sure that those victims are receiving um, what they need in our community. Um, well, at the same time that's going along with our criminal case, she's explaining um, the complicated process, the lengthy process that prosecution in these cases uh, results in. Um, the grant was awarded at $59,000. There's a 25% match. That's $19,333. Um, this was something that we had included in our um, budget presentations. It was a grant-funded position. Um, last year, Cam had started in August, so we still have um, funds through the remainder of this month, but hoping to have another year with her. Happy to answer any questions. All right. Anybody from the public that would like to comment on this agenda item? Turn it back to the commission for questions and or action. Commissioner Bender. I just would say that I'm a strong proponent of this. It's an opportunity for us to leverage um, funds and to have a position that helps those that are most in need. I think Commissioner Karski's fond of saying that, you know, we help those who are the most in need and those who need to be um, taken off the streets. I know you, have a, you have a pithier way of saying it. Um, <laughs> but I, I was at a uh, fundraiser for Children's Home Society this weekend and there um, was a woman who spoke who'd been um, through the system and had spoke very highly of the victim witness assistant that helped her in a very traumatic time and the work that Children's in had done as well and um, it really is an opportunity to help people turn their lives around so I'm, I'm very much in support of this. I would make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Benega? Aye. Bender? Aye. Kipley? Aye. Leinberg? Aye. Kersky? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Consider a motion to rescind resolution MC0075, electronic transmission to pay property taxes. And our treasurer is here this morning. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, uh, Chris Swanson County Treasurer. So today I am asking you to approve a resolution to rescind MC. 00-75, which is our electronic transmission to pay property taxes. This particular program permitted persons to pay their property taxes um, through electronic transmission and 10 equal payments uh, through ACH. Adoption of this rescission will eliminate the program within our office, and since the adoption of the partial ACH payment back in 2000, of October of 2000, Participation has been minimal, and the administrative costs to implement the program have become extensive. Of almost 79,000, of the almost 79,000 parcels in our county, less than 300 parcels are enrolled in this program, but even with it being such a small number of participants, the administrative burden to implement and maintain this payment plan is extremely high. Dedicated staff spend copious amounts of time processing transac transactions, reconciling funds and sending out notifications letter, notification letters, excuse me, I can't talk today. This program is a very manual process. This is all done by, uh, we don't have a specific um, um, program for this. Uh, IT, we got a hold of IT, they're not able to develop a program for us. And so this is something that we, is all done manually, by hand. So refunds then are often needed by participants in the program due to the sale of property, or maybe somebody went and paid a property tax off, forgetting that they were on this. Somebody has actually passed away, or a title company has paid it and didn't realize that they were still, or, you know, that uh, they'd already paid it. So, it, it. so when that happens, then Cindy has to go in and she has to refund these people, which is another process, which I think some of you have already seen. You've come down to the office and seen that it, it is time consuming, very time consuming. Um, and additionally, there is. There are numerous other means to pay taxes in a timely manner separate from this program, and this is be, whether it be in person, by mail, by telephone, or online. 
So if approved, all current ACH enrollees would be notified of the change by the treasurer and the program would conclude on December 31st of 2024. Any questions on that? Before we uh, do questions, I'll take public comment on this agenda item. Anybody here want to comment on this? <clears throat> I'm John Cunningham. I have no particular uh, uh, Give opinion. Me name. I'm John Cunningham, uh, 4904 South Oxbow. I have no particular opinion on this, but the obvious question is if the costs are high, that's a subjective statement, not factual. Can we, uh, I, the obvious question is how high is high? Thank you, sir. All right. Actually, and sir, it is factual because <laughs> what we have here. You don't have to know an actual cost. Uh, I'm going to. Oh, uh, cost, no, okay. Okay. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, that's fine. Anybody else from the public want to comment on this agenda item? Okay. I'm going to close it that and turn it to the commission for questions or actions, um, discussion. I, if I, I'll lead this off. I've been paying mine. I'm one of the 300 out of 79,000 and you know, I thought it was a simple process. You know, you take my taxes for me once a month for 10 months, and I love November and December. I don't have to pay property taxes. I wasn't aware of the internal workings because it's not like I pay them and they go into the, my tax account. You guys have to basically impound them, and then twice a year you pay in April and October. So, I mean, there's just a, quite a bit of administrative paperwork that goes in here, and then if a property sold, and these aren't all owner occupied. It's there are a lot of moving parts, and um, such a very s small percentage of the people that are actually taking advantage of it. State statute allows us to establish this, and if we it doesn't require us to. It just allows us to. Mm -hmm. And I, I know you're always up against the deadline in January. The state doesn't always isn't always real timely and. Correct. saying starting in January, this is what the taxes are. So it's, I, I've seen the process and work for four years and I, I, I'm supportive of it. It just, um, even though I'm a beneficiary of the, the program the way it is now, I can understand why this probably needs to go away. Mm -hmm. So, Commissioner Bender. And I would just say that we have been looking at this now for months, trying to figure out if there was a, um, some way to automate it, some way to streamline it so it wasn't so staff intensive and require such a disproportionate amount of our staff time compared to all the other workload um, that we have involved. And ultimately, I think that after we all looked at the complicated spreadsheet and saw the um, amount of time that it takes for each one of these, that it's just not a efficient use of our staff time, the benefit to the overall taxpayer base um, isn't there um, when you compare it to the costs and the fact that we might have to hire another person if we wanted to keep this in place. And so I'm supportive of it as well. Commissioner Blindberg. I would agree with both of your statements about it. And I also really appreciated, Chris, the um, plan you have in place to communicate to the people who do use it to make sure that they're not caught off guard, I think that's right. important for their planning purposes. So I feel like I'm definitely supportive also. Thank you. And thank you for all the work you guys have been doing on it. Thank you. All right, commission action. Make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Kipley? Aye. Bender? Aye. Benega? Aye. Blindberg? Aye. Tursky? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. First reading and motion to set a date of Second reading for Tuesday, August 20th, 2024, for an ordinance amending Ordinance 6021 regarding licensing and regulation of medical cannabis dispensaries. That was a lot to say. All right, good morning. Tom Greco, Commission Administrative Officer. Uh, this morning is just the first reading on this particular ordinance uh, to amend, as uh, Chair Carskade mentioned, Ordinance 60-21, which was originally adopted in October of 2021. Uh, this establishes our cannabis licensing regulations. Uh, just as some minor background on why I'm actually um, before you today, 
Uh, we have previously had a lottery system in place to select um, or provide for um, the licenses or, or to bring them forward to the commission. Uh, the lottery has proven uh, somewhat unsuccessful. Uh, the first applicant uh, was never able to actually uh, begin operating their establishment and then we went through two additional rounds of the lottery process with no applicants at all. Uh, this does create uh, addi essentially additional work on the part of the auditor's office to put those notices out. Um, I think this, and if we don't get any applicants, then we are generally required to put another notice out and, and keep on doing it iteratively until we get somebody to apply who's qualified uh, and can receive the license. So what this does is that is it removes the lottery provision within the original ordinance and replaces it with essentially a first come first serve uh, provision, uh, so a license would be awarded to the first qualified uh, uh, applicant as long as they meet all the criteria that's otherwise specified in the ordinance. Uh, this ordinance uh, makes some other minor housekeeping changes, uh, but be beyond those housekeeping changes and the change from a lottery to um, to the first come first serve basis, uh, there really aren't any other major changes in the ordinance itself. Um, I would like to thank, we, we have had discussions internally. Uh, we've included the planning department, certainly the auditor's office uh, and the state's attorney's <laughs> office in looking at this. So what I would ask today, uh, this wouldn't necessarily be a hearing at the next meeting. Usually we publish a notice of hearing. Uh, just ask that we're able to set a date a second reading for August 20th. All right, thank you, Tom. Public comment on this agenda item. Turn back to the commission for discussion and or action. I'd say it makes sense since we have not had any applicants uh, doing a lottery system with the way we've tried it before it hasn't been real successful either and somewhat controversial. So I think it's time to change it. I would agree three years ago we weren't sure what we would be getting into and it made sense to do it this way. We got to be flexible and change our plan so this this does make sense on one level so look for a motion so move second motion and a second to set the date of second reading for tuesday august 20th 2024 all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. oppose same sign motion carries Consider a motion to approve and authorize the chair to sign a purchase of service agreement between the state of South Dakota, DSS, HSC, and Minnehaha County. Good morning, Warden Matson. Good morning, Commissioners. Mike, Mac Mike Matson from the Minnehaha County Jail. Um, this is a renewal agreement with DSS for our competency restoration program. Uh, it allows us to bill for housing and uh, outside medical services if needed and medication. The only change in this agreement from the last one is the last one <clears throat> set a cap of 175,000. This drops it down to 150, which is more in line with what we've been doing. All right. Public comment on this agenda item. Commission questions, discussion, action? Make a motion to approve. Second. second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Consider a motion to authorize the highway department to purchase a Craftco SS250 and two routers through the Minnesota state contract 228767. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Commissioner. Steve Groen, Highway Superintendent. As part of our approved fiscal year 2024 capital purchase plan, we're seeking your permission to purchase the Craftco crack sealing kettle and two routers so we can start doing in-house crack sealing. Public comment on this agenda item. Commission action, questions? I'll move approval. Second. Motion and a second. I'm gonna um, ask a quick question. Are, are these replacing, maybe you said that, a, a new equipment? Are we doing different operation within the highway department that we're gonna be purchasing these? Um, 
Uh, Mr. Chair, this would be new equipment. We currently do not do crack sealing. We do mastic, which is a different procedure where you're laying a wider band over cracks. When you're crack sealing, you're actually routing out the crack and putting in a small band. It's something we contract out right now. Okay. And it's something I've been hoping to do for the past. Three so we years. do the mastic, but we don't do the crack sealing. Correct. Which so one looks like toilet operation. paper on the road? Uh, crack sealing. Okay. Okay. All righty. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you, Steve. Consider a motion to authorize the chair to sign an agreement between Minneapolis County and Wellington Township for cost of corrugated metal pipe for flood damage culverts. So once again, Steve Drone, Highway Superintendent. Back in June during the flooding, Wellington Township lost two 60-foot-long, 9-foot diameter corrugated metal culverts on 268th Street due to flooding. Uh, we anticipate that the cost of replacing these culverts will be reimbursed by FEMA. When uh, I met with the township out there, they requested instead of 60 foot long pipes that we order 70 foot pipes just due to the skew of the creek so they can get the culvert ends out farther and better protection. That's something we agree to do, but there's an additional cost for extending the culverts. This agreement uh, would, if FEMA does not reimburse the county either for the culverts or for the additional length, the township has agreed to pay for the additional $14,000 to order the longer pipes. All right. Public comment on this item. Commission action. Make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Please call the roll. Benega? Aye. Kipley? Aye. Thunder? Aye. Blindberg? Aye. Tursky? Aye. Motion carries. Consider a motion to authorize the chair to sign an agreement between Minneapolis County and SRF Consulting Group Incorporated for design of Project MC 2307 SRF Bridge Investment Program application. Yeah. Yes, sir. Steve Groen again, Highway Superintendent. Back in uh, February of last year, the commission authorized us entering into a contract with SRF to uh, seek some bridge investment program funding from the federal infrastructure law. SRF uh, helped us make this application earlier this year. Back on Monday, July 22nd, we had a debrief with the US DOT. The DOT provided some direction to both the county and SRF on ways that we could make our tweaks to our application to increase our scoring and thus increase the chances that we would be successful in our application. We are seeking just over $3.1 million in federal funding to replace these three bridges. SRF uh, provided a scope to do this additional work and we're request requesting that you approve this amendment for a not to exceed a $4,000. All right, public comment on this agenda item. Commission action. I'll move approval. Second. Motion and a second. I have one quick question. Can a bridge investment program be also under the bridge improvement grants, the BIP become a big or? Uh, no, sir. This is a st strictly federal funding. It has nothing to do with the South Dakota DOT big, big fund. Why would it be one versus the other? It's a different funding source. It's a part of the, uh, what they called the bipartisan infrastructure law that was passed by Congress a few years ago included several uh, bridge uh, funding opportunities for different categories. One of the categories I felt, uh, Jacob and I felt we qualified for, so we worked with the consultants to go for it. This is strictly between the county and the federal US DOT. The South Dakota Department of Transportation is not involved in this funding. Interesting, okay. All right, we have ask a motion. A a yes, sir. I yes, could just ask a follow-up on that. If for some reason we were unsuccessful with this application, would these bridges be eligible for the state program if we chose to apply that way? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Bender, we have done some preliminary work to get to this point where we could do this application and that effort could be used to, for future big funding applications. At this point, if we're not successful this time, I think we will just, if there's another round of the federal funding next year, I think 
at this point. After we would do a deep brief, if we're unsuccessful, we would make a few more adjustments and try again for the federal funding before we go after state funding. Our scoring right now isn't really high for big replacement funds because the bridges aren't posted. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Benninger. Steve, uh, remind me, is this particular grant also have some designation with uh, wheel tax funding? Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Benega, I know this is independent of wheel tax. Okay. The wheel tax is only for the South Dakota DOT big grants. Thank you. All right. We have a motion and a second. No further discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Consider a motion to authorize the Highway Department to purchase a TIMCO 435 on an Isuzu NQR chassis through the Minnesota State Contract 244545. Once again, Steve Grown, Highway Superintendent, this was an item that was preliminary approved in next year's budget due to the lead times in acquiring these units and our hope to have this ready for next spring. We're asking your permission to place the order for the Timco sweeper on an Azusu chassis through the Minnesota State bid. All right. Public comment on this agenda item. Commission action, discussion. Move for approval. Second. Motion and a second. Any further? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Okay, briefing on updating the Envision 2035 Comprehensive Plan. Scott, we've been looking forward to this one. Well, thank you, Scott Anderson, Planning Director. And uh, today I'm going to give you a little bit of an update, a briefing on um, the activity that uh, we are currently undertaking with the Planning Commission and the County Planning Department to update our Envision 2035 plan. And just, I'm um, you all know what a comprehensive plan is, but I will just for the public explain that a comprehensive plan is an overlying document that outlines how the county uh, will uh, manage land use and uh, concepts for growth into the future. And under state law, you have to have a comprehensive plan in place before you're allowed to have a zoning ordinance. So that's the importance of a comprehensive plan. And periodically, you are required to adopt one and sometimes in smaller counties and communities, that's just it, you adopt it. But in a, in a larger, more dynamic community like ours, it's typical that you pre periodically go through updates. So that's what we're doing. Our last comprehensive plan, the Envision 2035 um, plan was adopted in June of 2015. So it's been nine years, so it's time to go through an update. And I have a short PowerPoint presentation that will explain sort of where where we have been, where we are right now, and, and where we uh, will be going with the update. So, um, yeah, Trish, if you just advance it out. So these are the chapters of, of the comprehensive plan, and uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, these are the chapters that we've completed, and uh, how we've gone about doing this we're, we, are, we are doing this all in-house. Uh, my planning staff and myself have been working on these chapters, and then we are working closely with the Planning Commission. Uh, we provide them the information before the meetings so they can read it, review it, and then at the end of our um, regular meetings, after our items are through, we have a, a good discussion on, on the um, chapters that we presented if they have any questions, we, we dialogue, we explain um, what has changed, what we see is, as needed changes, and then we go from there. So the next chapter is, or the next slide, uh, explains that as part of the overall concept of the update, it was decided that we really needed to have um, a, a density task force put together and um, that density task force was going to be given the, the task to look at um, residential growth and development and how we are approaching that as the county, how it, how it fits into our comprehensive plan and zoning ordinance. And um, that 
uh, task force was appointed by, it was a planning commission task force. It was appointed by our chairman of the planning commission. And the task force uh, committee members are on the um, screen. And they uh, were Bonnie Duffy, who's the chairman of the planning commission and is here today. Thank you. And Tyler Tordson, Paul Cosbooth, Susie O'Hara. And then the next two were planning commission members, uh, Adam Morehauser and Mike Ralston. And then Sean Hagee from CCOG and Bob Munt and Joel Engel. And the group was put together in February, and we gave them specific tasks to look at for each meeting, and we met three times in March and April and May. And from that task force, if you would advance the slide, there were several outcomes that we had really robust discussions on. One of them was um, if we should tackle, if we should look at ADUs and an ADU is an accessory dwelling unit. And these are concepts. And, and a ta the task force made recommendations to the planning commission. And ultimately, we will look at these. They may or may not be incorporated in the, into the comp plan once it goes through the entire process. Because it'll go to the planning commission, and then it'll come to the county commission. And there'll be public hearings on it. And at that time, you we can have discussions on ADUs and uh, but we do get a lot of requests. If you, are, if you have worked with the Planning Commission, you, and it, it, you probably have heard this from constituents, that I really would, you know, we have this acreage, but I have an, uh, an elderly parent that I need to keep an eye on. And so I really would like to have a, 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 granny, a granny flat or a, 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 a tiny house or a guest house. I mean, we run into this all the time, uh, people needing maybe a little extra space on their property for whatever reason. And those are considered ADUs. So we had a really robust discussion on how we could potentially accommodate an ADU, what impacts it would have on land use, what impacts it may have on surrounding properties, how it might be perceived and received by neighborhoods. And so we are proposing that potentially looking at adopting a mechanism for a accessory dwelling units. And if you go to the next slide, um, those, this, uh, an, an accessory dwelling unit would require an ordinance amendment to our zoning ordinance, which would then put in the, into place how it would be handled. Um, it, we, they made a recommendation that it would allow a small house in addition to any permitted house. It had to be located on the same lot as the primary residence, and it had to be a, approved through a conditional use permit process. And that, I've, I, I've, you know, if you know me, you know that I really feel strongly that you need to have community involvement, and that conditional use permit process allows the neighborhood, the, the surrounding property owners to be notified and to participate. So we, they met, made a recommendation that we would uh, handle this through a conditional use permit process. So all of that is now being discussed in our comprehensive plan. Ultimately, it would potentially, it would have to be added to our zoning ordinance and that would be subsequent um, ordinance amendments that we would work through. So um, if you would go to the next slide, uh, one, of the other, one of the other meetings we looked at was how we had a, a really good discussion on building eligibilities. And uh, a building eligibility for the public is the, the right to uh, build a residence on a specific piece of property. You have to have a building eligibility before you can construct a single family residence on a property. And there is typically one per 40 acre parcel in the county. And you can move those around. And there's some, there's some, uh, there's some availability to, to move those. And in order to do that, sometimes you need to have a conditional use permit. And uh, if you, having served as county commissioners, uh, occasionally you have, we have run across uh, parcels that don't have conditional use permits that you, you, and there you can if you go through a long process 
sometimes obtain one from a neighbor, but it is complicated. And so we looked at how we could potentially um, deal with transferring that. And the, this task force came up with the idea of allowing building eligibilities to be transferred between adjacent parcels regardless of if it was in the same ownership. So if, if, you're, if one farmer or one person has a building eligibility and they want to sell it to the adjacent property owner next to them, we could do that just through a simple conditional use permit, not have to be in the same ownership. I, I will, the planning, this planning uh, task force, the planning commission task force, we did have a very good robust discussion on uh, transfer of development rights. So where you could, let's say, move a building eligibility from Wall Lake Township up to Del Rapids Township. And what, what, that, what the consequences of that would be, what the impact of that would be. And ultimately, um, there was a lot of development people on that task force and business people, and it just did not look like it would be the right move, the right concept to start really throwing open the, that building eligibility transfer process. You could, you could end up with um, building eligibility deserts where uh, all the building eligibilities from, let's say, uh, Wellington Township that is quite far away from, from a metro area, they could all be depopulated and moved to, like, say, Split Rock Township or Mapleton Township where it uh, may not it may already have a density that the uh, townships are dealing with that they don't need you know an influx of maybe a hundred building eligibilities so uh, long term it just felt like the right thing to sort of allow those to stay in those townships it also has a tax a tax implication too if all your building eligibilities are moved out of there and in 20 30 40 50 years as the city continues and our municipalities continue to grow out, those more rural areas likely will be also facing development um, requests and pressures. And so uh, the, the task force opted to make some minor changes to building eligibility transfers. But, and, and once again, that would require an ordinance amendment and would be something that would come to the Planning Commission and this body for final action. The next slide, the, the third meeting, we looked at how, uh, as Commissioner Kipley liked to, likes to say, is how to get to yes. And we looked at what, what might be some criteria that could be adopted that could foster more intense residential development where it's appropriate. So we looked at what what criteria could be allowed or created. Um, and the next slide goes over if you'd advance it. Uh, so we came up with this, uh, the outcomes of, of residential criteria that would go into the comprehensive plan and it would look at uh, allowing some in more intense residential development if it could meet some criteria. And that criteria would be it would have to be a 40-acre parcel or larger. It would have to have direct access to a paved county or state highway. Uh, the property would, had, would need to have a road district established for, with paved roads. The, min, the maximum lot size could not exceed one-half acre because the intent is to create areas for housing and not like large hobby farms. Uh, the development would need to have uh, access to a sanitary sewer district or the ability to create their own central sewer system. They would need to uh, have available water, uh, sanit potable drinking water. This develop the proposed development would need to implement stormwater management with retention of for stormwater uh, for a 100 year event. And we can see that some that is important because we do get you know, huge rain events. And then uh, the, d the development would have to be within or adjacent to uh, transition areas for f as identified in our future land use. So 
that criteria was this idea of having some criteria to address um, development requests was a good thing and it would be incorporated in, into the zoning ordinance, uh, sorry, the comprehensive plan. That would not require a amendment to the zoning ordinance. This would just be criteria that would be useful for reviewing requests that come in. So the next slide, so these are, the, the next slides I'm gonna go through are some of the chapters and uh, some of the information that is in each chapter and where we had a few minor changes. So there's a chapter on population and employment and, um, and the areas we looked at were population projections, employment opportunities and development trends. And then for the next slide, uh, we'll show you some population projections. It gives you the, uh, the 2022 population of the unincorporated parts of the county. It gives you a future population and the, the uh, red line, I need to look at this, uh, the, the, the chart on the bottom are the, so the red line shows the rural areas and then the green line shows the small towns and the, the blue shows the population of Sioux Falls and then the purple actually shows the, the combined population of the entire county. And in 2045, we estimate that the county, the, the county population it will, will be about 250,000. That's an estimate. Um, and, and that is, you know, a 20 year figure or estimation. So the next slide, we looked at the land use chapter and then we talked about the history of land use, the changes in land use. We looked at development trends for both agricultural and residential and commercial and how those trends are changing. If you go to the next slide, uh, somehow we just lost my PowerPoint presentation. That's all right. You need, there you go. You need to go to that comprehensive. There, there you we go. go. Thank you. Right there. So we look, we're looking at land use, and then we, this is the existing land use analysis for the county, and it breaks it down into uh, ag, residential, uh, commercial, it, all the different kinds of land uses it, it, are identified. And we updated that using our GIS and other methods. The next slide um, uh, talks about, so, this is the, uh, a graph that shows the amount, the, the total new single family residences that have been built in the, in the county, the unincorporated parts of the county uh, for the last 20 years. And uh, it, it gives an anticipation or uh, a, an approximation of what we would be, uh, how many building eligibilities and how many new residences would, would expect it to be created in the next 20 years. And that would be about a thousand new residences. This is useful information for people like emergency responders, uh, for um, townships. It also is good information for the um, sheriff and what might be needed for um, additional staffing to respond to that growth. Because every time you place a house out in the county, you likely, they will likely need services from the county and um, they will put more growth and more traffic on roads and bridges and so on. So it's, it's useful information for many aspects of, of the county. The next slide 
we looked at growth management, and in the growth management chapter, we looked at agriculture, uh, agricultural tourism, and then industrial and commercial uh, uses and residential uses, and and that the management and the land use within those um, those areas. Uh, this this slide explains or shows the number of farms and it compares it to the number of farms in the county between in the in from 2012 to 2022 this comes out of the USDA uh, information that we were able to uh, get the number of farms and the sizes uh, you can see that um, some the some overall the number of farms are falling uh, there are there were growth in smaller farms of of one to nine acres, and that size of 180 to 500 acres. But overall, the the other uh, size of farms and the number of farms you can see are falling a little bit. The next slide. Uh, this is also that growth management, and it goes back to that. This is how we would propose something new for growth management within the, the residential area. And this is the criteria that I went over on getting to the yes or in installing or implementing some criteria within the comprehensive plan on that might be useful for you as a commission and the planning commission to say, yeah, it really does fall into the criteria that we wanna see residential development occur within. So the next slide. Uh, the next chapters that we looked at were rural conservation. And in that chapter, we looked at historic preservation, the natural character, farming and community and housing density. The next slide. Uh, so this is inter interesting information. And we, so there are approximately 8,600 available building eligibilities within the county that you could used to build a single family residence. We anticipate based on historic documentation that approximately 500, we will use approximately 530 over the next 10 years. And part of the discussion that that task force had was to not to, not to drastically change those building, how we administer the building eligibility program, but to maintain that density zoning of one per 40 acres and then to encourage the continue to encourage the clustering of building eligibilities in in to make developments and then also to consider those new criteria uh, for transferring building eligibilities which would allow transfers to occur between contiguous property uh, despite with even not being within the same ownership the next chapter was the environmental stewardship. We looked at land resources, we park, parks and open spaces, water resources, drainage, wastewater treatment, and stormwater management. And we presented information to the, to the um, planning commission and uh, updated our parks and rec recreation map. Uh, you might not think that that changed much, but it did change a little bit because um, uh, the Palisades State Park uh, expanded. Um, we see other, some of the other uh, parks and recreation property is like Game Fish and Park property that's available for recreation. The next slide looks at, we looked at agricultural drainage and in, in since we updated our, comp, or since we uh, adopted the 20, 35 in, uh, envision plan in 2017 we repealed the drainage ordinance uh, you may recall we had a drainage ordinance and that we uh, did tiling permits and that was repealed in 2017 so that our, our comprehensive plan reflects that and then we addressed it had a small discussion on stormwater management at one time um, the uh, state of South Dakota was strongly encouraging an MS4 program for some unincorporated parts of, of the county. They've since sort of walked back from that and are not at so much actively promoting that. But it's still good best practices to, to address stormwater drainage and we have some, some general 
suggestions within our comprehensive plan and how we will deal with that. The next slide, uh, we looked at trans one of the ch chapters is transportation. And then under the transportation chapter, we updated the rail, the highway, the, the functional transportation, the classification system. Uh, we looked at non-motorized uses, access management, and air transportation within the county. And this uh, gives you, this is the um, transportation, that functional transportation um, map. And it has also changed a little bit. If you recall, we have added like the Slip Up Creek Highway to the, to the transportation system. So there were a couple of small changes. We've updated those. That functional classification is important because it, it's useful for the highway department. Uh, and sometimes you, the, the federal highway and the state highway, the DOT, sort of require a classification for a highway um, and how important it is. And you can see there, there are varying um, types of, of transportation systems within the county. The next slide uh, talks about, so that's where we were. This, now we're gonna to move to where we are. Uh, we have two remaining chapters left, the future land use chapter, and then basically the implementation chapter. I'm happy to let you know that in two weeks, we will be discussing those last two chapters with the Planning Commission. So we, so we will be wrapping up the overall updates to the comprehensive plan. After that, the next slide would be, so moving forward, we're, we are anticipating um, and planning for some public input and open houses in October and November. Those will be held, we're looking at three specific locations. We've done this in the past, we've had really good turnout where we have had meetings in Brandon at the Sioux Valley Electric Building. We've had uh, meetings at the Del Rapids High School and then at um, the West Central uh, High School in Hartford. And then we get the word out and, and have some um, explanations on changes, sort of like what I've uh, gone, over, gone, gone over today with you, but we present that in a, in a format to the public. Uh, we have some different um, dialogue stations that people can come and talk to us about. And there's a number of different ways that we can uh, have public input and open houses. Um, so it works really good to have, because of the farming community, um, it works really good. There's a, uh, there's a window, a really good window of, of opportunity for having these type of meetings. And it's <laughs> after the crops are in and before Christmas. So uh, once, and once we get to that, that that's, our, our, that's, the, that's the sweet spot for having these public meetings. Once you get past closer to Christmas, People are involved with Christmas, and then you get into winter, and, and public meetings have at, in the in the evening public meeting in January just doesn't isn't really a, something that attracts a lot of people because it's the weather. It's just it just it's not the best time. We're also looking at uh, making a presentation to the towns and townships association. That that way we get a lot of township supervisors, and they can also help us get the word out. And ideally, we would have that meet. Uh, I'm not exactly sure when they meet, but we would be able to have them also make their constituents aware of some of our public open houses and hopefully get more attendance. It's always difficult to get the word out to, to get people into these public meetings. But so after that, um, after we um, after we have our public hearings, then uh, we go through the formal adoption process that's outlined in state law, and that's publishing hearing notices for the Planning Commission, having some public hearings. They'll make a, they will have the opportunity to hear from the public, make any other changes that may come up. Um, so we have those public hearings and sort of have our final work process uh, approved by the Planning Commission, and then once they have their public hearing, then it will come to the county commission. We also then publish hearing notices and have official hearings by the county commission where um, you will have the document well ahead of time and uh, go through it and um, make suggestions, changes. It'll be a public hearing in 
uh, we'll see what the public has to say that, uh, on how they receive it at that time. So I'd be glad to answer any questions, but I'm really pleased with the progress we made, where we are. Um, we should be um, finishing up. I would anticipate sometime in the spring of 2025, we should have, uh, we should have it to the county commission for approval and, um, uh, and uh, have it adopted. So I'd be glad to answer any questions you have. I hope this briefing, it's a little bit more than a briefing. It was quite a lot of inf information, but I hope it was helpful. And if you have any questions, I'll stand by. All right, before I go to questions, I will take public comment on this agenda item. Anybody want to address the commission on the work being done so far? I don't see anybody running up, so I'll turn it to the commission. Commissioners, any questions? Commissioner Bender. Well, one, I'd like to thank Scott and your team and the Planning Commission. This is a pretty heavy lift, and so we appreciate the approach you've used to kind of take it step by step, and I appreciate the update. I did have a question on the residential zoning criteria, which I think showed up on a couple slides for you. The most recent was that growth management slide. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if on the conversation that went around that criteria, does that criteria match up with what um, the cities, small towns in Minnehaha County would use, or where did you pull that criteria from? Well, uh, I actually didn't pull it from anywhere. I developed it myself. So it was just brainstorming and thinking about past rezoning requests and, and the issues that we've had. I mean, sometimes we've had rezoning requests where it's three miles down a gravel road, and that has been an issue. We've had rezoning requests where it's in, like, uh, they're septic tanks and they're, in, uh, they're right next to the Big Sioux River, and, and that's been an issue. So we looked at some of the, I, I use some of my institutional memory of, of, it, of problems that we've had and issues and that we've, we've had, and I sort of came up with a guideline of, of what would be ideal to help these, to help a residential development move forward. You know, it's, and you've heard them too, it's, it's, the, it's the going down gravel roads, it's um, I, sewage, it's the runoff. I don't want my neighbor, uh, my neighbors will complain or adjacent property owners are concerned about additional runoff onto their property. But then on the other side of that, we, we get property owners that feel they have the ideal piece of property to develop. And so I'm not saying that that list is a final list. There may be things on there that the planning commission or the county commission may find uh, uh, not acceptable. There may be other criteria that you think are really going to be helpful. It's, it's, I would say it's three-fourths of a way or maybe more. It's, it, it is the concept right now, and um, it may not be the final concept. So if I, I really value the opinions of my planning commission and the county commission, and so there may be other things that we want to add or change. And the public. The public is, is also very interesting. The public has some strong opinions on how development should occur within the county. Commissioner Blindberg. I would also like to thank you and the commission that worked on it and the task force that worked on all that. And I have a question on the same slide. Um, can you tell me or explain to me what um, the phrase within or adjacent to the transition area of the future land use plan means? So one of the, one of the slides, we, we have a, a larger uh, map and it, um, we, we could have included it, but there is an area that we have identified as a transition area. And some of that is based on an area. So almost every small community in, in our county has a growth area or a transition area. And we work with them on what their identified transition areas are. And then the, the, the task force then took that information and then also looked at what other areas 
might be considered a, a, like a transition area, and there's a specific map, and I think it, it does show it right there. It, so there is, there is the map. So if you look at that larger, there's, a, there's the city limits of Sioux Falls, and then if you sort of go around that, there's a, a tan area. That is that identified transition area. And that's the area that we would feel would be, would be um, the ideal location for heavy or more intense residential growth to occur. And, and once again, this map could be changed. Uh, it, there is an area around Del Rapids as well. So I, I don't want to leave out Del Rapids. But for the most part, it, it, in, it's uh, in, around Sioux Falls and um, extending out a, a ways. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Mr. Chair, I'll just pivot off of uh, especially Commissioner Bender's comments of where are these criteria coming. Part of it is my insistence that I think when we have rightly turned down some requests for to rezone to rural residential, um, and I think it has something to do with um, building eligibilities and basically if we just turned your property rural residential, it's like gifting you building eligibilities. That's a commodity on the market. But um, setting that aside, I think I talked with some developers after the fact and it was, you know, we have to say no because it's not consistent with our comprehensive plan, but they kind of say, well, how do you get to yes? What, what criteria would we need to meet? Um, and usually every case is different, like Scott's saying, well, you need to be closer to a paved road or you need to have uh, this uh, sewage system figured out. Um, but I think laying those criteria out, I think will help Scott and his staff have conversations with developers in the future of if they think they have the ideal place, piece of land, course they always have the right to bring that request forward but Scott will be able to have more concrete conversations with them of like you might want to take into account these elements into your plan if to give yourself the best chance of success um, but it's not, still not a guarantee that we would have to re it's not if they meet all those criteria we have to rezone it or if they are missing one we can't rezone it uh, but I think it just gives some guidelines of uh, some parameters of, of what the rules of the road should generally be um, so I, I appreciated the uh, all, the, all of my planning commission colleagues, and then also this uh, density task force. I think these are very complex issues that the potential solutions could be on quite a, a broad spectrum. So I think that's why we want some public input too on anything to do with building eligibilities or uh, expansion in some of the rural areas. I think people are going to have opinions across the spectrum, and we want to take that into account in a comprehensive plan. But yeah, appreciate you, Scott. Yes. Commissioner Benega, no questions? I think there always is going to be some controversial on <clears throat> building eligibilities and frankly now maybe expanding it a little bit if you can swap eligibilities in different locations. But um, I'm thinking that your population estimates are a little conservative because when you look at Sioux Falls alone, is growing by six to seven thousand people a, a year um, by the time we reach that 2050 mark I think will be well over 250,000 people but it may affect housing differently and I think so that 250 number 250,000 population number is the population within Minnehaha County so a lot of the growth that's occurring with the city of Sioux Falls is, is south of the city, or south of 57th, sorry, in Lincoln County. And so, yes, I agree, the city of Sioux Falls will be much larger than 250,000 in 20 years, but it's a projection of what portion of the Sioux Falls in Minnehaha County will be. That's, so it, it and I think it's probably in the, in, the, in the text of the comprehensive plan that is clarified. I do think it gives us an idea on a master plan on how county services are provided in the future. And that's something that will be part of our conversation soon. All right. Can you go to that projected population map? Well, I'm, I'm just curious why there's two different lines. Is 
two different purple lines, two different blue lines. What is that significance well, of that? It was way up. There. Um, I think that there, if you look at where we, if you get to where we are, let me. So, yeah, if you, if you look, the, I think if you go to 2020, that's the last census, and that's where it, that is where we specifically know without doubt, according to the U.S. Census, what the number is. And then as, as, you, as you move further and further out, I think there's a range, and that, that specifies or that indicates the potential range. You'll notice as you, as you look at the overall county population and the city population, there's a wider range. But when you get down to the small towns and the rural area, there's not much of a range because there, it's, there's not a, a huge uh, variability there. It's, I think it's a variability factor. Okay. So somewhere between the 250 and the 280,000. Yeah. Okay. So my question is on a more broader scale, and maybe this is what Commissioner Kipley was driving at, is you know, what's our, our vision as far as, especially when it comes to the rural residential? Theoretically, on a one-mile section of land, one square mile, you could have 16 building eligibilities. The uh, 640 divided by 40 is that how that's calculated, or am I yeah. okay? And you know, you could have one house on every 40 acres, and 16 houses basically scattered across this whole. So. To me, that's not. To me, that's not the ideal situation. But to have 16 houses on eight acres in a corner makes sense. Is that kind of what we're driving to with this, or what's what's the that vision well, as far as this goes? Uh, that that's the that's the current paradigm. That's the mm -hmm. that's what we're operating under right now. Is uh, mm -hmm. you have those building eligibilities, and they can be moved around. Um, contiguously within one owner. That's right now. And yes. we're looking at cha tweaking that slightly where you can transfer them a, to a, an adjacent property and have it as a different property owner. Um, practi practically speaking, that is doesn't really happen all that often because the county is already so fragmented. I mean, there are so many property owners and different parcels and, and so... You, there are not a lot of like really open sections that you have 16 available um, uh, building eligibilities. So uh, the the um, the actual working of, of of the system that doesn't occur that often. So, but I guess my broader question again goes back to: Are we trying to or create a plan to manage how that is done? Or are we no? Okay. The, the, there was not a plan that was, we're not looking at a plan on how we would manage building eligibilities other than changing, slightly tweaking that, that criteria where we would allow them to be transferred as long as they're adjacent to each other, they could be transferred to different property owners. How often could that transfer? I mean, I you, know, you could you could just continue to just move them along, move them along, move them along. <laughs> That's but what I'm wondering. You have to have yeah. a lot of cooperation yeah. and and willing buyers and sellers, and uh, you know, I could see that maybe happening once or twice. But I, I mean, to continue to move them, move them, move them, move them, it's that would be a huge process. And I understand what you you know what you said with you know this township down here to you know 20 miles away, not but any consideration. Or I don't know if there's any advantage or disadvantage to, and you know, does it have to be contiguous? Could it be transferred within one or two miles? We looked at that, and um, they there was a discussion on on that transfer of development rights on how you could potentially really move them out, and there was a lot of there was a lot of uh, apprehension and some concerns about that because there really is. There is a strong economic factor to this because 
um, there was a lot of concern from the task force because we had we had some agricultural people, we had some development people, we had agricultural development people, and there was a lot of discussion about how the how the value of these building eligibilities could be radically changed if you start moving them all over the place where you have a building eligibility that's right next to the Big Sioux River that is in a floodplain. It may not be worth that much, but if you're, if you're able to move that two or three miles, let's say to overlook you know, someplace up in, in Mapleton Township or Split Rock Township, it, it, it could, you know, value could be greatly enhanced. And mm -hmm. so, and likewise, when it's, there's really, it's almost like it is a commodity. And, and when you start really changing how that value of that commodity is perceived, it, it has an impact on people that have building eligibilities. And so there was a lot of discussion about that. It wasn't something that was, I'll just say there was a lot of consideration given to, to the whole building eligibility system because um, it has been in operation for 40 plus years. And um, there is definitely a, a sense of security in the value of them now. And there was some concerns about really just flinging the door wide open on this. Yeah, definitely an asset on the balance sheet. I would, it would give you that. Um, so right now, what's the minimum size lot for rural residential? Is it two acres? It's one acre. One acre. So that would be proposed on a development to down to half an acre. Not more than half an acre. We'd be looking at maximum, maximum of not so a minimum, really, but a we're maximum. really looking at if so. Part of you know part of the what we have been hearing as a commission is workforce housing and and um, affordable housing and really providing um, growth residential growth for for new people and, or for the growth of, of the community. And when you have, when you get into lots that are larger, like one acre and one and a half acres, first of all, they're not typically affordable anymore because the land, the cost of the land is already quite expensive. But then likewise, on, on the flip side of that, in order to really, in order for uh, a development or a developer to meet some of our criteria like paving and central water and sewer you need to get to that density so you can make it cost flow so it's so it, yeah. it, it and so actually we're trying to be fair to uh to the developer as well as the community and make it making housing accessible you really need to be able to get to that density and if you start building half acre to acre lots you don't get to that density where it's cost effective to put in paved roads and sewer systems and waste and stormwater management systems. And there was a lot of discussion about that as well because there was some concerns about, you know, we looked at that transition area that um, Commissioner Blindberg brought up and there was a lot of concerns about if, if we allow a large residential development to, uh, to be created in some of these outlying areas, it really could affect our agricultural community because as you know, if you have a dairy or a feedlot or a, an intense agricultural use, you, there's pushback from people that say, I don't want that by my house anymore. So you ne we need to have space for agricultural uses too. And this is a, this is a sort of a guideline or a, 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 a format that sort of sends the signal, this is the area that really we feel is most ideal for residential growth. This is the area we feel is really, we want to preserve for agricultural uses. Okay. And I'm going to ask the commission to indulge me for a second. I'm going to kind of go off the rails a little bit on my next question. Um, rural residential, other than cats and dogs, what kind of animals could you have on that one acre or half acre? Um, can you have chickens, ducks, goats, sheep? I mean, can yes. you, if you can have you can have chickens. You have to go through a conditional use permit process. 
Uh, Put chickens on your rural residential property. Up yeah. There. Okay. I, 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 we I, don't allow, no, we don't allow sheep, goats, pigs, cattle, donkeys. I mean, all those things are, are prohibited. So livestock is not allowed on rural residential. But if you own a one acre <laughs> lot out in the country, you could have chickens if mm -hmm. you go through the CUP process. Uh, if it's rural residential, yes. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything I think else? We're done. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Look forward to the process. Consider a motion to approve and authorize the chair to sign a contract with McGrath Human Resources Group for a job evaluation and comprehensive compensation study. Good morning, Carrie. Good morning, Carrie Deaver from Human Resources. I'm before you, I'm happy to request your approval on a contract with McGrath Human Resources Group. As just a quick brief overview, you'll recall that earlier this year, the commission approved an RFP to go out for um, proposals for this study. We had a group of um, department heads who are active in reviewing those, and that included Tom Greco, Steve Groen, Jeff Gromer, Daniel Hager, Amanda Halsey, Tracy Smith, and myself. Again, the purpose of that study is to conduct really three separate things for the county. We want to take a look at where our job evaluation is. Are we conducting it correctly? And is the tiering of our positions correct? And then we also want to do a comprehensive salary and benefits survey. And then finally, of course, we would want results from that to see exactly what pay structures would be recommended for each group of our employees. That department head group put in a lot of time and effort in reviewing the proposals that came in. They also spent um, about a two-week period interviewing four of those consultants. And then the last two weeks of J July were spent doing reference checking and doing some follow-up questions. We're happy to tell you that McGrath Consulting is the group that we're recommending. There's several reasons for that. McGrath has done projects of a similar scope and size as what we, we're asking for. Um, they have extensive public experience, and the consultants who work for them have passed public experience themselves. Um, we also felt they were one of the groups that probably best truly understood what it is that we were looking to have completed and understood the importance not only of just the salary side of it, but also that benefits survey. Uh, so um, just a little bit about what to expect. If you do approve this contract, just a reminder, this is not a quick process. It will probably take five to six months, and it will entail work on the part of all of our employees and department heads. Our goal is to have um, a kickoff meeting with McGrath here in August and set up a timeline for when they'll have those initial discussions with department heads about how they see their positions, how they see compensation philosophy, and some general issues or concerns that they think we're facing. After that, we'll probably start going out to employees and asking for position information. And then the surveying of our comparable entities will start. And all of that will come back in and be combined with proposals for McGrath. And you will see them back later this year, hopefully, maybe January at the latest, with a report and some recommendations for the commission to consider. Are there any questions on the project or the contract? Before we go to questions, I'll take public comment on this agenda item. All right, we'll go to questions. Commissioner Bender. Probably less in the line of a question than just a comment, but um, I know this is a process that we've been talking about and looking and anticipating for several years now, and I just, I know Carrie and her group have been working hard. Um, first, I'm putting the RFP together, and then I'm um, vetting through the, um, the responses that they received. I really appreciate the folks that served on the committee looking at this. It's a, a good diverse group of elected and non-elected department heads who represent the vast majority of the employees here um, at the county. And so I think that the process was sound and I, um, I am very willing to accept the recommendation of that group as to the, um, the final recipient of this. I think it will be really, really interesting to see um, what results we get back from this, and, and they'll be very helpful in um, planning for the future. So I'm fully in support of this. Commissioner. Mr. Skip Chair, just one clarifying question for you, Carrie. I think you said uh, we get the results back in February 2025. 
So any impact to budgets and changes to structural salaries that we'd be talking about that for uh, budget 2026, That's correct? That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Carrie, how many employees does the county have currently? We have about 620 budgeted FTEs, and then there are up to 100 variable hour or seasonal employees, depending yeah. on the time of year. It's one good reason for doing this, but yeah. out of curiosity, so you know, department heads, um, equalization, human services, human um, or facilities, you know, these are all non-electeds. But when it comes to the elected department, um, is, are they worked with any differently under this or is this I mean when it comes to like span of control and supervision of employees and that type of thing how much it, it, are those handled differently than they are if they're non electeds the employees themselves are not handled differently no I mean we look at it as this one entity and our goal with a, a comprehensive plan like this is to have a good combination of internal equity of positions across all departments whether they're elect, led by elected or an appointed department head and then that's balanced of course with the external market what is you know what does the data show that we need to be paying for those positions um, as far as interactions, we're looking to the people who lead those departments, whether they're elected or non-elected, to best know what their jobs do and what they see that's working well, who they see their competitors are. So um, there's not really a difference from that standpoint. How we pay our department heads, of course, are different, and that's one thing we'll continue to look at, too. You know, How do we pay those positions, whether elected or non-elected? Okay. Appreciate that. All right, so this is a motion to approve, so I'd look for permission to action. I make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. Call the roll. Blanberg? Aye. Kipley? Aye. Bender? Aye. Benega? Aye. Kursky? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on. Thank you, Carrie. Consider a motion to reappoint Cole Robbins to the Housing and Redevelopment Commission. Good morning, Meredith. Morning, Commissioners. Meredith Jarko with the Commission Office. Uh, we are requesting that you reappoint Cole Robbins to the Housing and Redevelopment Commission for a five-year term. Um, the Housing and Redevelopment Co Commission provides oversight for the physical structure of Safe Home. Um, programming for Safe Home is administered through human service through the Human Services Department, but this commission helps with um, some of the financial oversight and things of that matter. Um, Cole Robbins was originally appointed in February 2023 to um, complete a term from a previous member uh, who resigned before their term was up. Um, there is interest from Mr. Robbins in serving an additional five-year appointment, which would be effective um, August of 2024 to July of 2029. All right. Good to know he's being appointed with his interest. Um, <laughs> any public comment on this agenda item? Commission action. I would make a motion to approve Cole as a, a five-year participant in the HRC. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Motion carries. Same deal, different name. Appoint Tyler Klatt to the Housing and Redevelopment Commission. Meredith Darko again with the Commission Office. Um, Jeremy Roman's term on the Housing and Redevelopment Com Commission recently expired, and he was not um, interested in seeking reappointment. So the application announcement for the open position was available online from June 10th to July 17th. Tyler Klatt was the only qualified applicant to have applied for the position, and his term would be effective from August 2024 to July of 2029. Um, Tyler Klatt previously served in my position, so he is very familiar with the um, activities of the Housing and Redevelopment Commission. Public comment. Commission action. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Both same sign. Motion carries. Moving on to a briefing on proposed changes to the Minnehaha County Commission Rules of Procedure. Meredith Jarko with the Commission Office. Um, the Commission originally adopted the Rules of Procedure in September of 2022. Section 7.1 of the Rules of Procedure requires the Commission to review these rules each year. Included in this item are proposed revisions that have been identified and a redline version of the rules of procedure showing each proposed change is included. 
Um, there's no action requested today, um, but uh, only a discussion on the proposed revisions. Um, and once those are discussed and decided upon, a formal request to um, accept the changes will come at a later date. So there is um, a summary document of the rev revisions as well as the, the document itself. Um, I'm unsure of how much time you've all had to kind of review these. We can go um, revision, we can go one by one. We can look at the document. Um, I will say most of the proposed changes are um, mostly housekeeping things, clarifying some language, cleaning up some formatting. Um, there are a couple of updates that are a little bit more um, in depth, for example, uh, section seven point, the biggest one is probably section 7.1, um, does list that the rules of procedure will be reviewed in July. Um, the proposed change is to update that to January to better align with when a new chair and vice chair are elected and when there are new members of, um, of the board. <laughs> so other than that, um, a lot of the changes are reorganization, which again, we can go through line by line if the the commissioners would prefer. You know, they, these have all been available um, for us to look at and review. Of course, Commissioner Bender and I, a few weeks ago, sat in with you and Tom and going through these and it went through the legal process before that. So I, I mean, we've all had time to look at it and the public's had time to review it. Um, this is just a briefing, so we're not taking action, and this will come back to us when? Um, at the next commission meeting, oh, in so two weeks. two weeks from now. Yeah, so we'll have time for more discussion at that point. I mean, we're obviously uh, want to take public comment at this point, but it's, um, we'll go to public comment, and then we can go back to commission discussion, and It'll come back again in two weeks, so everybody will have time to look at it if they have specific questions. So, good morning, Gary. Good morning. Gary Meyer. Uh, I'd like to comment on uh, 4.10 or 4.11 consent agenda. And Dean, you said it this morning, you gave the public a chance to comment on consent agenda items. That was very good, I, I appreciated that. But the rules say that only a commissioner can remove an item from the consent agenda. I would like to see that removed to say the commissioner or the public. After all, the public, I think, should have a chance to pull an item if they want some discussion on a consent agenda item. It's very rare that it happens, so I don't see where it would cause any problems, but if there's an item on the consent agenda, I know I have seen it in uh, planning and zoning before where items have been removed, um, and it's very beneficial to the public. I would request that that change be made. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other public comment? Good morning, Leah Anderson, Auditor's Office. Um, my suggestion would just be to go back to having public comment at the beginning of the meeting before regular business. I know there's a lot of our public that would like to be here to have public comment and they're never sure how long the meeting's gonna last, and so it's difficult for them to take time off work to be here, and if they knew that it was at the beginning, uh, close to nine o'clock, they could plan for that a little better. Um, for instance, this morning, we're well into an hour and a half of time, um, so, and we're not yet to that item, so just a suggestion. Good morning, Cindy Meyer. I would uh, echo Leah's comments in regards to moving the public comment back to the beginning because we do have numerous people that would like to come and they're unable to. And another, another point that I would like to make in regards to, I believe there was a change or there's something noted in the proposed revisions in regards to addressing the commission as a whole instead of singling anyone out. And last week I was scolded because I singled somebody out and was um, giving comment in regards to how come they can comment and call us names and those in those situations. And when we bring that information back, we're not allowed to. We get 
shut off in those comments. And so one of my comments is, why, does, why doesn't anybody else on the commission stop a commissioner when they are attacking the public? It is our First Amendment right to be able to speak. And if that speaking comes out in, in regards to a comment against someone, it's still our First Amendment, uh, our First Amendment right. And so I would just like to uh, have that noted. All right. So again, this is a briefing. Go turn it back to the commission. Commission questions, action, or no action, discussion. Okay. Well, it'll come back in a couple of weeks then. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Consider a motion to reschedule the regular Board of Commissioners meeting from September 17th to September 10th. Good morning, Tom. All right, good morning. Tom Greco, Commission Administrative Officer again. And as the item says, uh, the request is to change the meeting date from September 17th to the 10th. Uh, the reason for this request um, is the rules of procedure that Meredith just uh, touched on does designate the first, third, and fourth Tuesdays of each month as a commission meeting date. The third Tuesday next month is September 17th, and at least three of you uh, will be out of town at the South Dakota Association of Counties meeting in Rapid City. Um, so the proposal here is to move that particular meeting up to September 10th, which is the second Tuesday. Uh, it just coincidentally hasn't fallen, out, fallen on a meeting date in the past couple of years, uh, but in the past prior to uh, the three meeting per month model, uh, the commission, if there was a association, if a county meeting would typically have canceled that particular meeting. Uh, but the intent here is to keep three meetings in the month um, and to move this one from the 17th to the 10th. All right. Public comment on this agenda item. Turn it to the commission for action and discussion. I'd move for approval. A second. Motion second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. All right. Opportunity for public comment. Um, first of all, if you haven't, if you have spoken and haven't signed in or plan on speaking, please make sure you sign in. And um, you have how many minutes? Five? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. I'm John Cunningham, 4904 South Oxbow. I'm here to discuss, to, I wasn't able to be here for the uh, meeting on the charter suggestions. I'd like to forward my comments now for, your, uh, for my bona fides. I have a master's degree in public administration from Harvard University with a major in public finance. So I will limit my comments to the organization, management, and financial issues. I endorse that uh, home rule uh, charter. I believe this is the best single proposal to come before this commission in the last 135 years. And the reasons for this endorsement are because of management, accountability, and the ability to grow as an organization. In the, uh, in, in terms of the organization and account, uh, accountability issue, at some point or another, uh, you'll get a, because of the makeup of the public, you're going to get a, an elected official uh, who, for example, can't keep their hands off of their uh, female employees. In the eventual lawsuit, uh, the person is responsible for the actions, has, a, has the authority to do whatever he, wa he wants, but the people who are, who are accountable are you. In the lawsuit, you will pay the bill. He caused the problem, you will pay the bill. Likewise, uh, more, probably more likely, a white supremacist is, is uh, elected who wants to cleanse the office of the undesirables. In the resulting lawsuit, you will be the ones who pay. And that person is responsible, you're the people accountable. If it was a department head, other department head that you appoint you have lots of op options to make sure it doesn't happen again. You can, uh, you can reassign, uh, uh, demote, retrain, or dismiss the person. But you have ways of making sure it doesn't happen again. With elected officials, your only option is to wait for the next lawsuit. That's not a good organization. No management professional or professor would ever recommend this organization. Uh, 
And uh, so what you effectively have in Minnehaha County are six different counties, each with its own elected county head. On the uh, issue of management, I've worked in Minnehaha County, started my career here basically in Minnehaha County back when Dirk was young. And I've worked in Prince William County, Virginia and Fulton County, Atlanta, Georgia, uh, running departments in all of those. I was assistant manager here. The uh, Prince William and Fulton County have, uh, have, a, have some elected department heads. Prince William didn't have any. And it is, in the 14 years that I was there, they were considered one of the best or the best managed county in the country. Received numerous uh, NACO awards. First thing was uh, a strategic plan. They adopted a strategic plan. You don't have one because with a fractured government, you really can't have a comprehensive strategic plan. Uh, they did. I was honored to be on that, uh, that team. And we got an ACO award for that, for that. We also implemented performance measures, uh, complex performance measures that, uh, that measured outcome, not outputs, not the things you do, but what the results were. And we received an ACO award for that. You can't, uh, you can't implement those here because you don't have the authority to. Those almost always go through the budget office, and you don't have the authority or the expertise to do that. With the performance measures we were able to, and the uh, strategic plan, we were able to implement a planning performance program budgeting, for which we also got a NACO award. And again, you can't change your, your existing budget is uh, incremental. Uh, should we increase this line item or that line item? Or should we increase both of them and uh, cut something else? It's an ad hoc, off the cuff, one year plan <clears throat> and you can't you can't change that because you need the permission and the cooperation and expertise in your finance department to do that and you don't have any of that so i'm going to say you uh, you don't have the authority or the uh, to to manage your county to improve the financial and operation management of the county and i think the charter is the only way to do that Thank you very much. I'll, I have some other comments, but I, I'm out of time. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Any other, anybody else here for public comment? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jean Childs. I live in Lincoln County, across the street from Minnehaha County, so very much affected by everything that happens here. Uh, I'm, I might be the only one in this room who's confused, and this is really quick. But this home rule charter seems to keep happening but not happening on the agenda but not on the agenda the news media is saying that it's been removed from the agenda but i've watched or attended the, all the recent meetings and there's been no there's been discussion uh mr joe kipley commissioner joe kipley has talked about it that nobody commented on what he said about it so at what point well, I'm not going to ask this question because I'm not supposed to, but I'm confused about when are we going to take action on this or has it been removed? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Gary Meyer. I guess I'm confused. I brought up a point on an agenda item that I wanted something changed on the on the rules and there's no discussion so why even get up here to say anything if there's no discussion i would like to know why the consent agenda item is only able to be removed by a commissioner and if you all feel otherwise i would at least like to see some discussion and i wasn't going to say anything until jean got up here and spoke she asked a very legitimate question where is the home rule charter is it dead is it coming back you made a comments that you appeared that there was public backlash so you weren't gonna bring it, but there hasn't been a motion that it has died or that you're gonna bring it up next year. And Jean had a very legitimate question. Where does it stand? You can't comment to a question for a public comment. We've got a legitimate question. 
it doesn't require discussion from you. We just want to know where does it stand? Where does it stand? Anybody? Mr. Meyer, public comment is not for debate, or if you have questions or that type of thing, it'd be best to address them to a commissioner at a, on an individual basis, give the commission to, a, a chance to reply to it if they want to during non-action commission discussion, but we don't, well, it's, I'm, not I'm not debating, answer, it's not a question and answer, it's not a question and answer time. I'm not debating. We don't take action on um, public comment, at, especially at the time, it's not on our agenda as an actionable item. So we hear you and um, we have a process for addressing these things. So two of the commissioners made the comment that it was appeared as though it would not come forward before the election. So the public just has to, that's, that wasn't really an answer. You didn't all decide it was just two of you made a comment off the cuff comment that it looks like maybe we need to hold off for a while. I think the public does it. I mean, Gene made a legitimate question, and there are others that are questioning the same thing. Where does it stand? To not answer a question from a public comment to me is wrong. We're not asking for a debate. We just want an explanation. Where does it stand? Mick Baruth, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Thank you for your time. Um, can we get the Elmo? How do we do that? Oh. So through all of the uh, election stuff we've been talking about, um, I got to thinking we are, there were so many people who were so concerned about the auditor spending a few thousand dollars to do a 100% hand count audit, that I thought to myself, why isn't anybody ever bringing up how much the county is actually paying ES&S for their black boxes? So I submitted a FOIA request. This is what I got. Can it be zoomed? Thank you. Uh, since the year 2014, $1.2 million. That's the equivalent of over two, almost a quarter of a million dollars per election year. And we're concerned about paying a few thousand dollars to our own constituents? to give the residents of the county confidence that these machines are correct? We could pay a lot of people a lot of money to do some hand counting and we wouldn't come close to a quarter of a million dollars per year, per election year. And this doesn't include what we've got to pay yet this year for a big general election coming up in three months. So we could easily surpass a quarter of a million. For that kind of money, obviously, we must be getting something. Thanks to the hand count audit, we were able to prove that the machines are capable of counting properly, at least close. Capable. That doesn't mean they've done it every time. That doesn't mean it's going to do it every time in the future. Here's what we don't get for spending a quarter of a million dollars per election year. Elmo again, please. This is a sample ballot. And you'll notice on here that 
in this particular election, I marked that Gary Hansen was voted for and Devin Saxton was voted for, uh, but Gary Hansen was crossed out. For a quarter of a million dollars, we have a machine that can't distinguish voter intent. And when Leah tried to show this before because she used a ballot that had nobody's name on it, you guys had to scrub it from the county commission video. That tells me really only one thing. We don't want the public to know what these machines can and can't do. There was nothing on that ballot she showed that verified anybody. So thankfully this one says sample right across it. Maybe we could educate the public. The recount with the tabulators took one hour less than a hand count the next day, which was done by 50-ish people with a large percentage having no experience and taking no pay. 27 years ago, I was introduced to the concept of follow the money trail. It explains almost everything to us. And it looks to most people like ES&S is taking enough taxpayer money to launder some of it back to somebody, just like our selected officials and unelected but also selected bureaucrats in Washington are lining their pockets with the endless wars and the foreign aid. Lastly, sir, your time is up. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Good morning. I'm Mike Mathis. I'm the election coordinator here for Minnehaha. I just wanted to start by saying I apologize. I underestimated the amount of time it was going to take to do the hand counting of the primary. Um, some things happened. Uh, we learned a few things. Uh, I did not think about all the paperwork that we were going to have to do, so I, I do apologize. I, I misled you when I said the hours that it was going to take. Um, another thing I want to talk about is, do you all see what is going on in the world right now? Um, as the election coordinator, I manned the window, and I've had a couple soldiers come up to the window and register to vote before they're getting deployed. Um, the federal government is warning us of dis disruptions on election night, yet here we are not preparing or doing anything as a state to get ready. As that soldier was leaving, I said, I wish you the best to the one soul. I, I wished him the best. And uh, as he was leaving, I could see the tears welling up in his eyes. He was 21 years old and is off to the Middle East. These men and women are going to a war in a foreign land. The least we can do is make sure their voice is heard. We found mistakes in the hand count. The machines are not perfect. These machines are perfect is a false narrative. Plain and simple, they are not. There was voter intent issues. Much of who we are in South Dakota is on the ballot this year in the general. Like I have said to a few people, these PM beers, with these PM beers, our elections are not of the just South Dakota people. These people are from all over. 90% of the people who want to vote, who are at these locations, want to vote on the president and the president only. And I, I respect that. I, by all means, if they're an American citizen, they must be able to vote. I take calls from these folks daily. Here is an example of one of my calls. Hello, I live in California, but am registered to vote in South Dakota. Can you send me my absentee ballot request form? I ask, have you ever lived in South Dakota? The answer is no. I was there three years ago. What citizen of South Dakota, South Dakota are happy with this? I am from California, but am voting in South Dakota. I agree these people have every right to vote for the president, 
as they're an, if they're an American citizen. We have our officials not coming up with a better way than having them vote on everything. I know you say whatever the number of the votes won't affect anything. It won't affect us. Well, don't we prosecute a person if they vote twice? Well, why would we let someone that openly admits they live in California vote in South Dakota? There must be a better way. Has the state even tried? And a lot of this is directed to the legislators, so it's not directed at your body. But we, as a state, do we have not a better solution? There are thousands of these across the state. An emergency session or something needs to be called. I will never forget that soldier walking away from the window. I wish everyone could experience that moment. Democrat, Republican, independent, non-party affiliates, we are all humans, and the decision of the leaders at every le level impact many innocent Americans. To the ones that are unsensitive to making sure our elections are of the utmost integrity, including our media, what are your motives? Good morning, Jessica Palama. Um, I wasn't going to speak today, but I will finish up what Mick didn't get to say. So if you could turn the elbow on again, please. And see if I can get this to face the right direction. So um, what Mick wanted to address was the, the PMB issue and kind of playing off of, there we go, is that right? What Mike was talking about. So here is a binder of voter registration forms that we purchased from Minnehaha County. And all of these are just Minnehaha County. We had to pay for these. Um, we have thousands more from across the state. And here's a little analysis of looking at those. And so these voter registration forms that look like this. Here it is. This is one from your best your, your best address at uh, 8th Street. Um, you can see at the bottom, the signatures come across looking like this. So this comes through the DMV. And the DMV, um, they're not interested in, in processing voter registration forms. Their job is driver's licenses. So these come through all digitalized like this. And there's a signature clipping software that basically hijacks the uh, signature of the purported voter off of their driver's license form and affixes it to a voter registration form. Well, you can see the affidavit at the bottom of the form. It says, I declare, under penalty of perjury, two years imprisonment and a $4,000 fine, that I actually live at and have no present intention of leaving the above address. So we have thousands and thousands of voter registration forms that are perjured and are affecting our elections. This is an analysis of random samplings that we have purchased from Hanson County, Lawrence County, Minnehaha County, Pennington County, Lincoln County. And 99% or almost all of them are perjured or incomplete. So the law is not being followed. And now you have an auditor that is actually following the law and enforcing the law. And when these people get turned away for not being able to fill out the form properly or provide proof of a physical address, which the form requires, uh, they're going over here to Lincoln County over uh, by Panera Bread and claiming that they live in that commercial building. Now we've got all the zoning ordinances, um, they're in this binder. The city and county zoning ordinances do not allow people to live in those addresses. Yet we have about 5,000 people registered to Dakota Post. So we have a massive perjury problem. And if we, had a law, if we didn't have a law enforcement problem, we'd have a lot of people going to jail including former officials in the county. Um, so, in, and having been to the legislature repeatedly, the Board of Elections, Secretary of State, uh, county commission meetings all across the state, instead no one has done anything, so uh, the citizens yet have to find another way to enforce the law. And one of those was the challenge at the precinct, which was fully legal, and um, a legal method in the law to challenge these. So there is a 2019 article out there, you can find it on our website, where the um, Secretary of State's office, the Pennington County Auditor says, 
We are told by the state to just shove them through. Don't verify them, don't do your job until someone challenges these voter registration forms. Well, the challenge has come, it's not done yet. You can expect more problems and this, uh, some members of this board have already been uh, sued again. So that was actually not what I was gonna talk about, but is one of the priority issues that is causing problems and is going to dilute the vote when we are amending our constitution in November. So we have extreme measures coming on the ballot that affect everybody's everyday life and so people who have perjured their voter registration forms who have never, um, were not properly registered in the first place are illegally casting ballots on constitutional amendments in our county and our state. But what, can you turn that back on again, please? But I wanted to talk about, um, thank you, was the July 31 CISON FBI release, and I, it might not show up on my phone for you. Um, if you guys can see that there, you can go out to CISA.gov, who is the governmental entity that is charged with protecting our elections. Um, July 31, they put out a press release saying that we're going to have cyber attacks on our elections. Basically, there's nothing you can do about it. We're gonna have an information blackout. You're not gonna get results. So how do these county officials upload the results of our elections? It's into a cloud-hosted, um, internet-based, internet, or er, election night reporting, and that voter roll system is in the cloud. CISA, the government entity. Thank you. Okay, that's charged with protecting our elections, said it's going to be attacked and they can't fix it. So I'll send you an email with more information, but that directly relates to the hand counting issue that we have to be prepared because the federal government is telling us so. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm gonna move on to commission liaison reports. Commissioner Benninger. I've had a couple. I uh, attended the Sioux Falls Development Foundation Board of Directors meeting uh, a week and a half ago, which uh, talks about obviously the development of the community in the region and they are having lots of uh, activity. Um, and I also attended the Sioux Empire Fair Board meeting and a lot of the conversation uh, obviously was about the uh, fair that's going on this week. Um, and tomorrow is the Ag Appreciation, so if you haven't volunteered for that, they're looking for more volunteers. Um, talked a little bit about the number of uh, people that are needed and uh, frankly, how some of the restrictions for, I'd say minors being there after certain hours, which has uh, been taken care of very, um, I'd say professionally by the sheriff's office and the people who are volunteering as uh, uh, individuals. So it's been a very calm fair. so thank you. Excellent. Any others? Commissioner Blindberg. This evening there's a community engagement park party at Emerson Park. Um, we'll have most likely sheriff's office, fire, police department, along with several organizations with um, services for the public. So people in that area are encouraged to attend and um, they are also taking volunteers if anybody wants to show up. Um, the next one is gonna be August 15 at Hayward Park and both of those are from 6 to 8 p.m. And then the museum has their opening of their new exhibit this week, um, Thursday evening from five to seven. It's the Chronicles of um, Courthouse Chronicles with very uh, thorough displays. I got a sneak peek when I was at the museum last week. Um, very interesting displays on the history of the courthouse, circuit court judges, um, the sheriff's office, the auditor's office, register of deeds. Um, I'm sure I'm missing some, but lots of very interesting um, history photos and, and pieces of history to view. So that's from 5 to 7 p.m. is the reception for the opening on Thursday. Mr. Chair, I'll speak yep, to uh, our courthouse neighbors next door. Uh, Governor Noem appointed new, three new uh, Second Circuit judges, so they are now at full capacity. I expect 
sometime by the end of September, those judges to be installed, one of them probably down with our friends in Lincoln County, uh, but we will be at max capacity in our courthouse. Uh, so appreciate all the work the facilities team has done to uh, get some courthouse renovations going to uh, have offices prepared and so on. Uh, and then that maybe pivots to not so much a liaison assignment, but um, as we look towards, nec towards next year and a master campus planning, I had the pleasure of touring the new one stop on the east side today for so that'd be our friends in state government. And so they're consolidating about 13 different state agencies out there on the east side by Dolly Farm. And uh, I encourage as you get the opportunity, uh, they'll be moving in December, uh, January timeframe in some stages, but I'd encourage my colleagues to get out there and see how efficiently state government can uh, lay out different departments and whatnot, and it might give us some ideas in our own master planning for this campus. How would we consolidate different entities into office space or rethink how we, uh, we do uh, long-term planning for uh, the, the main campus downtown? But I think that's all I had. Thank you. All right. Moving on then to non-action commission discussion. Anybody have any items? Mr. Mr. Chair, Kipper? I will clarify that I would not be present presenting a home rule charter this year. I think uh, that just needed a little bit of clarification. Also happy to have conversations with people if they need that clarification, but just to put a, put a pin in that one. And I would follow up on that. Yeah, I thought a couple weeks ago we made it clear that there would not be put on the agenda anything to talk about home rule charter this week because today was a deadline to put it on the, to be a voted on by this commission, to put it on the ballot in November. Um, Commissioner Kipley and I spent a considerable amount of time meeting with citizens and putting together a home rule charter based on our experience in government. It, we've edited through a legal process. Um, the, was it perfect? No. Our briefing three weeks ago, a month ago, was intended to um, garner public comment on it. And we, we got an earful specifically on a couple of items. I think I still feel that a home rule charter for the management of the um, county is a good idea, but I don't have the, it in my wheelhouse, I just don't have the time or to, to commit to it at this point. And it was suggested that it be a citizen-led group. So if a citizen group would like to assemble to put together a, a home rule charter committee, and I would sure lend my um, some time and effort to it, um, input into it. But if it's going to be a citizen-led group, I'm totally fine with that. This at this point, I do not see it coming before the commission for any time in the foreseeable future as a, as a commission-led um, initiative. So um, I'm just trying to put that to bed. I hope that answers those questions. Um, any other non-action commission discussion? All right. I'm going to look for a motion to enter executive session immediately following our meeting for the purpose of South Dakota Codified Law 125.2, 134, and 6. By immediately, I mean about 10 minutes after. So moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Next door. Thank you.